Sup, y'all, and welcome to Technological and Environmental Transformations, Part 2. In this video, we're going to take a look at the impact of agriculture. So here you see the end of the last ice age, as the temperatures rise over a period of thousands of years. Men and women were hunters and gatherers, and groups of around 50 people, almost constantly on the move following the seasons as well as available game. This style of living was a natural and logical division of labor in which the males primarily carried out the hunting, while the females primarily carried out the gathering. Of course, the vast majority of people are not hunters and gatherers today, so we come full circle to ask, what is the great catalyst of change? As Plato has often been paraphrased, necessity is the mother of all invention. So, when conditions change, reducing available resources, such as food, it becomes exceedingly difficult to maintain the carrying capacity or capability of a place to sustain the population. Sometime around 11,000 BCE, global temperatures dipped dramatically in what was known as the Big Freeze. Tonight's forecast, a freeze is coming. And this was followed by a global shift to warmer and drier conditions. It's so hot. Milk was a bad choice. Now, large mammals, such as woolly mammoths and giant sloths, failed to adapt, and they died out. Likewise, wild grains and berries also failed to grow as plentifully as they once had. Hunting and gathering became woefully inefficient. People starved and died. They needed an alternative. If colder global temperatures have proven to be the great catalyst of change, what are the keys to success under such drastic changing conditions? While there are a litany of plausible and arguable answers, we will look at two specific explanations, culture and geography. Yeah! The keys to success can be compared to a poker game. First, we'll consider geography, or more specifically, the physical environments in which people live. Certain places, at certain times, have more resources, or are better suited for human survival and success. So, in this analogy, geography is like the hand you're dealt in a game of cards. The second key is culture, or the customs and beliefs of a group of people. Those whose values and tendencies are best suited for the changing conditions are more likely to succeed. Considering the analogy again, it's not just the cards you're dealt, it's how you play your hand that determines success. Now, even before ancient man had developed technology such as agriculture, they had improved other things, such as improved tools like baskets or weapons, such as you can see the, the stone arrowheads you see right here. Also other innovations like the controlled use of fire. But one of the most impressive advancements they made were granaries. There's evidence that sophisticated ways of storing food through granaries in the Middle East date to over 11,000 years ago. Now this is significant because it predates seed domestication of crops, crops such as wheat or oats, by a full millennium. Some have even suggested that the development of granaries actually may have led to plant domestication, which is the deliberate planting of wild seeds. And this was done in order to make the gathering process easier. So what invention started it all? The plow, likely first originating in the Fertile Crescent. The plow enabled people to organize the planting of crops and allowed them to better predict the amount of food they would produce more accurately. So, with technologies such as granaries and the plow, mankind transcended into an entirely new age. Around 12,000 years ago, the first agricultural revolution began. No event was more important for modern human civilization. Now, agriculture is the deliberate tending of crops and livestock. As colder temperatures gripped the globe, the availability of food through hunting and gathering became ever more constrained. Out of necessity, the Neolithic era began around 12,000 years ago. Neo means new and lithic means stone, so the new stone age. Agriculture, and consequently human civilization, emerged primarily along river valleys. People would choose crops based on traits like taste or nutrition. So what was actually happening was that natural selection was being trumped by artificial or human selection. This is known as selective breeding, which we also refer to as plant or animal domestication. Even before the Neolithic era started, 
Plant domestication began with vegetative planting of root crops, such as beets, radishes, or parsnips, as you see here. Parts of plants were placed in the ground to grow new plants. This is what's known as horticulture, the cultivation of flowers, fruits, vegetables, or ornamental plants. The invention of agriculture probably first occurred around the tropical seashores, where settled fishermen could produce enough surplus food so they could invest some of their time in experimenting and nurturing plants and animals. Now, the big jump forward occurred with the cultivation of seed crops, such as corn, barley, or wheat, as you see here. These crops are much more difficult to grow efficiently than root crops. The cultivation of seed plants beginning around 12,000 years ago was the true beginning of the first agricultural revolution. It took a great deal of trial and error in selecting the best seeds from existing crops, sowing the land properly, watering the plants, and harvesting the crops at just the right time. Hearths of seed agriculture occurred independently in regions like Mezo and South America, West Africa, as well as places like modern-day China and New Guinea. However, the most important location of early agriculture took place most likely first in Southwest Asia along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, in what is called the Fertile Crescent. This location in modern-day Iraq had the best collection of plants and animals suitable for domestication. Examples of seed agriculture there include wheat, barley, and protein-rich lentils for food, as well as flax for making linen. It would benefit you to jot down a few of the other crop types listed at the different hearths. Not to memorize all of them, but to be aware of the origins of many of the foods we depend on today. It took generations to reach the level of sophistication necessary to grow, harvest, and domesticate these crops, such as the corn shown here. People also began to domesticate animals. This likely started hundreds of years after plant domestication had begun. Today, around 40 species have been domesticated. Now, most agriculturalists were subsistence farmers, meaning they produced food for themselves, their families, or their local communities and markets. So, to wrap things up, we'll look at two different types of extensive subsistence agriculture, in which relatively large areas are farmed, but with relatively low inputs of labor. And these lifestyles exist to this very day. Many subsistence farmers are sedentary, remaining in one location, while others have adapted a more mobile lifestyle. Such is the case with shifting cultivation, in which new farm fields are established after a few years in order to find more productive land. This activity is primarily located in tropical and subtropical areas, such as the rainforests. Usually, farmers move, or shift, to an area, cut down trees and vegetation, plow the open land, and then plant their crops on the new ground. When the land is depleted of nutrients, often after a few years, farmers start to cycle over again and shift to another area. A common type of shifting cultivation is slash and burn agriculture, also known as swidden or milpa. This style of farming is carried out by cutting down trees and then burning them in order for the ash to fertilize the soil. These societies have existed for millennia and still exist today. However, their numbers today are probably as many as a couple hundred thousand worldwide, and shrinking. Shifting cultivation is just not productive enough to sustain large civilizations. With deforestation and modernization, fewer and fewer of these societies remain. Opposite the tropical rainforests are the arid and drier climates in and around the world's deserts. Here, another type of extensive subsistence agriculture emerged known as nomadic pastoralism, in which livestock are herded either seasonally or continuously in order to find fresh pastures for grazing. Typically, these nomads herd goats, sheep, or camels depending on their location. These nomads often move their herds to higher elevations in the summer and then to lower elevations in the winter to find the best pastures. They usually traded their animal products such as milk, skins, and meat for crops such as wheat or barley. As with shifting cultivation, nomadic pastoralism is just not productive enough with respect to the amount of food produced per unit area, so their numbers have also remained small. So, these early agriculturalists set the foundations for the civilizations that would soon follow. It is arguable that had the big freeze not occurred, the world would still be entirely inhabited by hunter-gatherers. We likely owe our modern world to our ancestors, who adapted to the changing conditions of their world. And there was much rejoicing 